and welcome to Empire with me, Anita Arnand. And me, William Derimple. In this episode of Empire, we have our very own Anita Arnand to talk about her astonishing prize-winning book, The Patient Assassin, which won a prize I've been trying to get and failed. I've been shortlisted three times, never got it. It's pretty much the only prize you have not won. (laughs) Please give me this. The Tiltman Prize, which is the big pen history prize. And no book has ever deserved uh, to win this prize more because it is an absolute um, model for how to write history, which is both deeply researched and archivally uh, astonishing, but also which reads like a thriller. I, 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 I remember reading it full of envy and admiration oh. uh, a couple of years ago when it came out, The Patient Assassin. Well, it's funny because we were on a book tour when I kept hiving off to do research or right. I kept disappearing. So we were, we were mysterious. mysterious. <laughs> we were on a book tour of India for Koh Noor and we happened to be in the Punjab and I just kept going, Willie, I'll be back in three days because <laughs> I was going through archives and boxes of papers. Um, and you were, yeah. you, at that point, you were not talking about what you were no, doing. I so I didn't know what it. you were up to in mm. you know, these little disappearances, but uh, you had a very smug look on your face when you came back each time as your story began to form. And perhaps the best place to start is to ask why this story means so much to you personally. So so it was a story I never wanted to write because it's it's difficult, it's complicated and it's hideously painful, Um, but it's kind of entwined in my family history, Um, which is what this podcast is about in a way, isn't it? Is how much of modern history is informed by what has happened in the past. So, I mean, I always grew up with a story that my grandfather, who I never met, by the way, died fairly young. Um, he was in Jallianwala Bagh. So I grew up with this story that um, the massacre in Jallianwala Bagh in 1919, if you listen to the podcast with Kim Wagner, we went into great detail about what happened there. 1,650 rounds fired into an unarmed crowd of thousands of people. Which completely changed every Indian's attitude to the Raj. Some people still had a lingering feeling that it was something they could live with. Uh, and work uh, with, And even was benign. Yeah. Uh, and, and after this, both Gandhi and Nehru, and also Tagore, all decided that they had to dedicate their lives to getting rid of the British. So, I mean, history is made up of the stories of ordinary people, right? So, you you know, one of those ordinary people in that garden on that day was my grandfather, who was this lanky Literally kid. your grandfather? My grandfather. So that my, recent. So my grandfather um, had uh, four boys, and one of them was, as we like to call them, the gift from God, <laughs> very late in life, sort of twilight baby, um, accident, my dad. You know, so there's a huge age gap between him and his next brother. But um, my grandfather at the time, in 1919, was this lanky teenager, um, depending on which member of my family, because no one ever wrote anything down in the olden days in India, was either seven or 19 years old when this happens. And what was he up to in Jelly Wonder Why well, was he there? He wasn't political. So he was just this kid from the mountains. So you know the geography of, of India. Uh, on the border with Afghanistan is a very mountainous, wild area. Um, and that's the northwest frontier, which is where my father's family all hailed from, a place which called Kalabagh. Where, um, Kipling used to romanticise the, the, the frontiersmen as these these incredibly noble, brave, but also treacherous right. uh, Pashtuns or Patans, as Kipling would have called them. So, so my, my family, you know, sense, by, by sensibility, more Patan than they are Punjabi on my dad's side. So, you know, we you grew up with that Kipling story. I grew up with a story of my family who are ethnically Hindu. Um, seeing those camel trains of, of, of batans coming over, taking their wares. And at one point when my um, grandmother apparently was very pregnant with her first child and my grandfather then, this is sort of skipping forward, is very ill in Lahore, the only person my great-grandmother would trust her with was a patan who would take her safely to see my, my then grandfather. Um, and because he wouldn't ride on the pannier with, out of respect. So he walked that entire distance to Lahore from Kalabagh, just holding his arm on the other pannier so that he didn't have to dis, you know, dishonor her by riding on the same thing. So we had a very different impression of Bataan's growing up. Anyway, so my, my grandfather in 1919 was either 19 or 17, depending on who you talk to. But he was sent down to the big city, to Amritsar, to go and buy sewing machine parts because that was their job. Yeah. They used to buy European sewing machines, refurb them and sell them on at profit. So this was a big deal. It's like his big visit to I the big I can still smoke. remember those Singer sewing machines and yeah. the Dursies were peering over them and, and working away. They make them last first. for decades. I mean, these things are very, very precious. So he comes to, I mean, if you heard Kim Kim's um, edition of the podcast, 
there has been trouble in Amritsar. It has died down within 24 hours and you have had two hours of peace and you've got this oncoming event called Vesaki, which is the Harvest Festival. And it is the time when deals are made. Wheelers and dealers come into the city and that's what my little lanky grandfather was coming to do. So he is in the garden on the day of the massacre and by a... With his sewing machine parts? Or? No, no, he hasn't got them yet. So this is, this is really pivotal. <laughs> so he's trying to get his sewing machine. He was trying part. to get his sewing machine. So he meets two friends who are ex sort of from the mountains who've settled in the big smoke. And he says to his mates, look, I've got to go and meet this sewing machine guy to pay him some money. Can you just keep my food warm and I'll be right back? And he goes to the, the main market, hall market in Amritsar. He passes an armed column, which turns out to be Dyer's column but he doesn't know what it is because he's not from the city he thinks this is what always happens and the next he knows that there has been a firing in the place that he was sitting just minutes before and are his friends okay well he doesn't find so the thing that is why this story haunts me and why I didn't want to write it for years is that I think this this episode destroyed him because he runs away so instead of running back to the garden to try and see if his friends are okay. He hides because, you know, the soldiers are on the streets. There is wailing sweeping through Hall Market. People are screaming. They're trying to get in to get to their loved ones. There's no medical aid there. So people are bleeding to death on the other side of this walled tenement. And he hides. And it's only the next day when curfew is over because there's a curfew declared, no medical aid, that he goes and he finds his two friends are dead. So the place where he was sitting, had he remained there... You and would not be here. I wouldn't be here. Sitting here now. Doing this now. So, you know, it's a massive part of our, our family history. But I think I've also heard you say that you partly wrote this book also because not only was this a big part of your own personal history, but it's also uh, an episode which has been so mythologized it really, that it's very yeah. difficult to get to the truth. And, and you were determined to try and find evidence for not only your, your grandfather, but, but the, the most famous story in India, little known here, yeah. about the man who tried to take revenge, Udham Singh. Udham Singh. So Udham Singh literally translates, Udham means the upheaval. That's a word in Hindi. The upheaval Singh is what his name is. And if in the India... The upheaval lion. Yes, the upheaval <laughs> lion, the upheavaling lion. But if, if you go to India, everyone knows his name. If you go to Punjab, often they will have pictures of him, another man called Bhagat Singh, who is another revolutionary. Has a hat and the moustache. They're very handsome, very, very handsome, very erudite revolutionary, but sort of, you know, believed in armed conflict. Um, and Dilip Singh, who's this Maharaja, you know, the last Sikh Maharaja of Punjab, who was, you know, sent out by the British. And we, we've done a podcast on, on that. So this too. was, this was in a sense, the, the path not taken by Gandhi. These were the people that were not Satyagrahis, who were not after nonviolence. These are the people that thought the only language the British understand is, is bombs and guns. Yeah. The, the, you know, we could, so you know Gandhi's philosophy of we will pile our bodies high, and when they're high enough, the British will understand they have to leave. They were like, no, we're not, we're not dying for this. We're going to, you know, we'll kill, but we won't die. So Udham Singh is very much off that stable, but he has been mythologized in India to this point where he does not resemble the man that he actually existed. So first Even the of, image, I think you've said the image is wrong. They had a postage stamp that came out. It's they took different. it. It's a different man. <laughs> it's a man who's standing behind Udham Singh in a group photograph, which is actually taken at the Shepherd's Bush Gurdwara in London. And they've got the wrong guy. They've got a man in a turban. Udham Singh did not wear a turban at the time that photograph was taken. You can see him in the picture. Um, well, this is a spectacular story. And in the next few minutes, we're going to take you um, on a world that's completely, well, certainly completely unfamiliar to me, the, 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 the Indian underground, by which I don't mean sort of, you know, shady bands in, in nightclubs, but uh, <laughs> um, visits to Bolshevik Russia and Nazi Germany, gun running across the Mexican border. It's the most, I, it was totally unfamiliar to me. But let's begin with... Udham Singh. The birth he's, of the upheaval. Should we do that? The birth, That's of, the like to call it. The birth of the upheaval. Yeah. So Udham Singh was born to nothing. He was never meant to amount to anything. He was born in a tiny place called Sunam, which is when we were on our tour, I kept disappearing to Sunam to talk to people and look through their rifle through their belongings. Um, but his father and mother were dirt poor. He had an older brother. Um, nobody ever really expected them to amount to anything or become anything. Their small holding was tiny. Their father grew little vegetables and a patch of dirt at the back of this so hovel that they lived in, which I've seen now. It's been turned into a, a museum now. Um, but 
he was not going to be anything. When he is barely three years old, his mother dies. And again, we've talked about this elsewhere in the podcast of the huge the waves. Spanish of illness. flu. Spanish flu. It's yeah. either Spanish flu or plague that sweeps across Punjab at the time. And it kills something like 12 million across it, India. It's an unfathomable it? yeah. number. More than, much, much more than the First World War. Yeah. So his mother, his mother disappears from his life. So he's just left him and his older brother and his dad. And his dad has to earn money. He has to feed these two boys. So he becomes part of, you know, whenever you talk about the empire, you talk about the railways. Well, he becomes an employee of the railways. First of all, he tries to become employed by uh, canal builders. So he's digging out the canals near the Doab, you know, sort of making money and he can keep his children close by because there's no one to look after them. You know, There's nobody who's willing to take them on. All of his extended family are living hand to mouth as well. So who's going to look after these children? And eventually he takes a job uh, at a remote railway station where he mans, basically mans a barrier. So all through the searing heat, all he has to do is lift the barrier, drop the barrier, lift the barrier. That's a job. Somebody has to do that job. You know, it's not, not all mechanized. Yeah. To this day in India, yeah. they, they do it this way. But at least he can keep his kids close to him. And, you know, there are many apocryphal stories from this time which are patently ridiculous. There is one which is told in retrospect that the two children, uh, Udham and his brother, are tied, you know, tethered by the waist to you know in a piece of string to the to the crossing and there's also a goat tethered there because that's how the their father gets milk to feed them and um tail seeing the father leaves them for a little while to just go and do something and a leopard stroke it could be a leopard or a like depends who you talk to a leopard lion or wolf i've even heard uh comes and little of them who is barely three years old at the time takes fights it off or? to either an axe or a stick <laughs> or some stones depending on who you listen to and batters this leopard straight lion straight uh, wolf oh my um to death which is you know marks him out as the man he's gonna nothing this is like, like sort of is. child I mean, hercules uh, strangling the snake in, in, entirely yeah. entirely that so you know that is almost certainly garbage <laughs> I think, can we assume that you know a little toddler is not going to be capable of killing fighting off a wolf <laughs> fighting off a wolf <laughs> stroke leopard straight lion whatever it was uh, but we do you know. and not, not least because there are no lions in the Punjab, and by and by the nineteen by you the nineteen hundreds, they've been wiped out everywhere except Gujarat. So, yeah. so forget all of that. But what we do know for a fact is that their father is, you know, worried and losing money and unable to support two children. So he decides that he's going to make this pilgrimage to Amritsar. And he's going to do it at a time when it's very, very busy because he might get work there. That's what, that's what we can assume. There are a lot of things we have to assume because they are low caste Sikhs who have not left a written record. So you only know this from people who knew them in Sunan, their home village. So he's on the road to Amritsar. He's hoping, some say, to get to the Golden Temple to at least pray for salvation, but he doesn't make it. He dies halfway there. <laughs> And he's got these two tiny infants who are sort of left behind. And it's a relative who comes and is called to take on these two children, but they can't feed them. They haven't got money. So they take them to the orphanage in Amritsar, the second city of in of Punjab, you know, after Lahore. It's the Amritsar. first being Lahore, yeah. Exactly right. And, he, you know, they go, this, this uncle of theirs bangs on this door and says, look, can you take these children? Because I can't look after them. No one can look after them. And the first answer, and I've been to the orphanage as well, you know, so this is, this is a real sort of traipsing around North India. This was during our book tour again? Well, no, after, no, after, <laughs> oh, before. I only did that a little bit of sneaking off. But, um, I, you know, they, they first say no. They say no, they can't take him on because they've got too many children. But it's because his father worked for the canals and there's a canal kind of bond, uh, you know, and, and the guy who runs the orphanage, his father also worked on the canals. He said, okay, I'll take them. And that is what happens to Udham Singh and his brother. They are brought, brought up, up in, a, in, a, in, in an orphanage. orphanage. Sort of, you know, in, in Indian mythology, it's, you know, they're brought up by the Golden Temple. It's not the Golden Temple. But it's very, it's close, close enough. Um, but Amritsar is his parent. So he grows up there with nothing but what he gets in this orphanage. Now, in the legend, Udham Singh, like your grandfather, was in Jolly and Wallabagh during the massacre. Is that something you've been able to substantiate or not? Well, you, so people are adamant. The story of, of Udham Singh and his revenge, the birth of his revenge, is that he is a water carrier in the garden on the day of the massacre and he's topping people's cups up. I can find nothing, nothing to substantiate that. Would there be any evidence? I mean, it's, is it not quite possible that he could have been there and it's just... I'll you tell know, you what I can water, say. Water, water yeah. sellers would not be leaving there. I can tell you what I can say with, with, with certainty 
is that he was in India. So what, what happens is that Udham Singh, you know, again, this is all part of the podcast history that we've been doing, is one of those young people that signs up to fight for the British of in course. World War One. He goes off to Basra, so doesn't he's, he? Yes, he's, he's, you know, he's only held in the orphanage until he's a, a teen. And, you know, they keep him actually a little bit longer than they should until he's about 17 and a half years old because his brother dies. The only relative he has, the only person who's, who he's ever loved and who knows him, who actually knows who he is, dies in the orphanage. And so he's all alone. He has to make his own money. How do you make your money? Well, there's a man called Sir Michael O'Dwyer who's running Punjab at the time, who is the you know lieutenant governor of Punjab, who is recruiting like crazy. And he's making all sorts of promises to people who sign up, saying, you know, come back with glory, you will come back for, and we'll give you land, we'll give you riches. So this kid lies about his age. He goes and he gets recruited and he gets sent off to Basra, where he is an unmitigated disaster. <laughs> he's useless. Again, a little bit of context here. So this is the First World War. Uh, huge numbers of Indian troops, particularly for the Punjab, sign up. And they, a lot of them are sent to the Western Front, but quite a few are sent off to the disastrous British expedition to what's now Iraq. Yes, and Mesopotamia at the time, Mesopotamia, Mesopotamia and there's campaign. A, there's that's a terrible right. siege in a place called Kut, um, uh, which, uh, which many people get killed. Uh, and then there's an uh, only marginally less disastrous engagement in Basra. Exactly. And he's, he's not even a fighter, by the way. He's, 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 you can assume that he's pretty young and useless because they put him on the repair detail. So he has to repair um, vehicles and boats. That's, that's his job. And he, because he's learnt carpentry, one of the only things that he is taught at the, at the orphanage is you know, basic letters and carpentry. And he's quite technically... Adept. He's good. He's good with his hands. By all accounts, he's good with his hands. I mean, there are you know sort of reports from the orphanage that you know he was good with his hands. He was good at that. So they, they, as far as they're concerned, they've equipped him to get a job. He joins up and he's doing this job. But he is, um, according to those who sort of knew the family in Sanam, he is insubordinate. He doesn't like being told what to do, and so he is sent back in disgrace. And he doesn't come back to riches, and he doesn't come back to um, you know a hero's welcome. Which is what he, he and all Which the is other what he thought he was going to get. Up, thought they were going to have. Yeah. But instead, what he comes back to is the Rowlett Act, which we've also spoken about in previous um, podcasts, where there is even more draconian treatment. And so, you know, was he in the garden? I don't know. And I think, I think maybe not. Maybe not. But I think um, we can say that he was in India because at the time, if you go forward 20 years and he does the act that makes him notorious and immortal in India... Um, the British try everything they can to try and place him somewhere else, not in Punjab, and they can't. So, you know, there's secret documents in those wonderful IPI folders, the Indian Police Intelligence folders, where they are desperately trying to place him in any other country other than India, and they, they can't. All they can say is we cannot say with certainty that he was in the garden. So I don't know. Only he knows. Could be true. But some people think he was. So this brings him into contact after uh, Jalimwalabagh, after the massacre, Everyone now is turning against the notion of British rule. Uh, I mean, it seems surprising to us that anyone would be for it in the first place, but many were. But after the Jalil Wanabug, uh, the British are regarded as murderers. They, they've broken their word. They've, they've killed these people. He, however, does not sign up with Gandhi and the nonviolent brigade. He joins something called the Gudda movement. He so initially he tries, but they won't have him. Nobody will take him seriously. You know, near illiterate. He's got, he can read and write, but not much else. He's, un he's deeply unimpressive, you know, so he's kind of a leaflet boy for, for a while after the massacre. He's running around, he's doing errands. One school of thought, which, you know, I'm, I'm sort of charmed by because I suppose maybe it's because I understand about survivor's guilt and I think that's what happened to my grandfather. You know, we'd sort of left it that I think that episode of what happened um, at Jenny Malabar kind of ate him alive, really. You know, he was taciturn after that, never spoke, didn't want to talk about it. When He went blind very early in life. And when people came to commiserate with him, he said, just do not, I don't want your pity. God save me that day. It's only right he take payment. It's only right he take the light from my eyes. You know, so, so survivor's guilt is a terrible thing. So if one believes one strand of this story, which is that Udham had come back from the war, is deeply, deeply cheesed off and is delivering letters and leaflets for the gathers, desperately trying to be something. And he's the reason that some I mean, people I mean, go to the garden. That's, that's a 
great deal of guilt. How would big is the gutter movement? Because again, you know, we, those of us are brought up on uh, on the film Gandhi. These these guys are sort of you even revolutionaries heard of them. in the corner, yeah. um, making sort of muttering remarks about Gandhi. Uh, were they a major force? No, I mean, n- numerically, no, but actually potency wise yes i mean so they 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 all stem from largely from the the idealism of a man called hardeal who comes again in fact to europe and to you know britain and is is faced with terrible racism and sort of feels like he is a lesser human even though he's a man of intellect and, and prowess and then just decides hang on a minute this doesn't feel right how is it that indians are treated so poorly in their own country he's touring around europe at the time he spends a lot of time in france where they're not having any truck with you know british empire and he goes back and he is you know he's he's going to be hanged if he goes back to india so he goes to america and san francisco becomes the headquarters of the gather movement so the gather movement you know they have this and this is just like i mean this is the kind of 1920s equivalent to i suppose al qaeda in the sense that it's something which is international which is running guns which is yeah. uh, embracing a, a, a military uh, uh, resistance and it's also uh, investigating bomb building See, and- interesting that you should say al qaeda because you know to others it's the rebel alliance from Star Wars, okay. it's, you know, it's the Jedi Knights. Okay. Who are, you know, okay. it depends yeah. on what's like, really. Who's, who's it, one man's hero is another man's. One, yeah. is another man's but as far as the British villainy, authorities are concerned, they these guys are to use the modern pun, it's terrorists. They're terrorists. They're yeah. terrorists, and they, you know what they are? They're, they're completely unapologetic about what their aims are. They, you know, they have as their master. What do we believe in? Gather, which means revolution. How do we do it with you know guns and violence? They're they're very frank about it. So that is who Udham aspires to be because they're the tough guys. We're going to have to take a break now but we'll be straight back and we'll see where Udham Singh goes next Welcome back to the Empire podcast uh, I am William Darumpel and I'm talking to my wonderful Anita Anand my co-presenter about her award-winning book The Patient Assassin when we left uh, we were at the moment when Udham Singh has joined the revolutionary gutter movement. Mm, or trying to. Uh, trying he's, a, to. <laughs> he's basically a boot boy. He's desperate, but nobody's taking him seriously. He wants to do. He wants to be somebody. He wants to be a man. He wants to be the big man around town, and he's nothing. And like many Punjabis trying to make themselves, he goes abroad. So he is actually extraordinarily well-travelled by the end of his life. So he can't really be taken seriously by the gutters. They don't really want to know. They give him leaflets, but they don't trust him with anything else. So instead, somebody says, look, you're going to starve to death if you don't get a job. Go and work on the railways. The British are building railways in Africa, in East Africa, in Uganda. Go, you'll get money there. You you know, you have to sign a contract. You have to stay there for a number of years, but you get paid well. This would be, I mean, an early form of indentured labour, effectively. Well, it, yeah. yes, but he doesn't know that when he signs up. Again, it's like joining the army. You know, he doesn't know. But what he does find, you know, he finds terrible hard work there. They call it the lunatic line, by the way. It is this long stretch of railway that stretches from Kenya to Uganda. Um and people die. You know, a lot of Indians die on this railway. Some are eaten by lions. Most are taken by disease. They're are treated they, horrifically. Are they just Indians in these labour gangs, or is it a mixture of, of, of Black African and, and and I mean, in the movies in America, it always seems to be Chinese workers. Building yeah, I mean, they're, they're, they're a mix. Yeah. But you know, the Indians are in their own sort of encampments, and the Indians are working on stretches of their own. And inadvertently, what they've done is because they're mistreating. <laughs> they're so mistreated. These people, they become um, little revolutionary pockets. So it's the first time he actually gets some kind of notion that there is an international struggle going on is in East Africa. And in East Africa, someone says, you know, if you really want to be a revolutionary, if you really, really want to fight this, you've got to go to America because that's where the gathers are now. Go to go to her, the Isles lot, go to America. And that is what he does. He, he, How does he do that? I mean, it's not an easy thing to get to, to no. leave a, a, a railway uh, work gang and, and suddenly take yourself off to California. <laughs> no, well, he, you know, and it's, and it's a circuitous route that he does it. I mean, it's, it's unbelievable. Actually, it's unbelievable. And, and I completely understand why people want to turn this into, you know, sort of a, a drama. Because it's, it, if you wrote it, if you wrote it down as a fictional script, people say, go away and write something more believable. So he goes back to Sunam and he wraps up all of his affairs and he tells his uh, his uncle who's living still in the village of his father's birth look I'm going I'm going to do something I'm going to be somebody and but how <laughs> exactly <laughs> how is he going to do it? he doesn't know but with him saying it becomes very clear as a very charming very charismatic limpet of a man so he finds out that there is a young boy called Preetham Singh who is from a neighboring village who has a scholarship to go to America 
he he has he's very bright and he fastens onto him says i'll be his chaperone i'll take him but this guy Pritham Singh needs to get paperwork from London first so he does this weird circuit where he goes to London which eventually will be the place that makes him and he's with Pritham Singh they're trying to get paperwork they fail to get the paperwork because they're stuck in a nightmare of bureaucracy anyone who's been trying to get over to Dover lately (laughs) (laughs) it's a walk in the park compared to what they went through so they try to get in illegally so they meet people in the Shepherd's Bush Gurdwara here in London who say, you know what, stop trying to ask for an official application. He's got the place, sneaking through Mexico. And that's what they do. So he is escorting this, this other character. Slightly bemused young kid who, who worships him, by the way, who thinks he's everything to him. And he goes off via Mexico. Yeah, and Mexico is a really interesting place in well, the 1920s. Sort of like Butch Cassidy. Well, it is. Butch I Cassidy's mean, what, uh, the first decade. Yeah, so maybe we're talking about 20 years after Butch Cassidy but in the Wild, sort of West. world. Of, oh, no, yeah. it's, still, it's still sheriffs and it's posses and it's guns and horses. Uh, and they go to Juarez and they, you know, they then from Juarez try and get to El Paso, which even then is the crossing point to get into America. And and there's Singh, no there's no Trumpian character trying to stop them crossing. It's it's the beginning. It's the nascent beginning, and I've got it in the book of the uh, of what is now ICE. So it's the first time they're setting up offices on the border with El Paso to stop people from passing through. So they definitely don't want them and Pritham across the border, even though Pritham has got letters from his professor. There's a wonderful um, set of documents I found from a professor Riggs in Michigan who keeps saying, look, he's my student. Please let him through. And they won't let him through. He's trying everything to get him through. He can't get him through. So what Udham does, and this is actually the mark of who he is, and I, it's controversial, but I, you know, I, I, I said some things about him appall me and his ease with which he uses people around him, I find very appalling. So Udham Singh dumps Pritham <laughs> at the border because Pritham's now sort of, you know, in the legal slipstream of, you know, his professor Riggs is trying to get him across. Udham's not waiting. He pays underground Indians. And by the way, this is at a time in the 1920s when a man called M.N. Roy is in Mexico. Founding a communist party. Founding the communist party in Mexico. It, it, a close, you know, sort of associate of Lenin who flies over and and... Again, Attends I mean, Trotsky, meetings Trotsky's with passing Lenin. through this sort of territory too. At this yeah, time, I mean, he doesn't. It? He's one of the few people that doesn't pass through this story. <laughs> but uh, but Udham crosses the border and gets into America without Pritham. Underground. So I mean, at night. Um, yeah, it's like you know, proper mules taking people over in the in the shadows as they do even today. But he ends up. He washes up in America. This is going to be such a great movie when it's made. Oh, you're lovely. Uh, uh, um, but you know, sort of in America, what is what is to me extraordinary is this is still a kid from the orphanage. This is still the really rough edged kid from Punjab, who now in America learns to walk with a straight back. He goes he to sort of Santa Claus. He reinvents himself. So he starts to learn English. He starts to walk with a swagger. He starts to wear Western clothes. There are places where there are lines through, you know, cities, particularly in California, where the fruit pickers and Mexicans are on one side, and also increasingly Indians are coming over because they're farmers. We've moved from one movie. We've moved from Butch Cassidy to the Grapes of Wrath. Right, well, exactly fruit that. Fruit pickers and yeah, fruit pickers yeah. and you know Mexicans and Indians and a lot of Punjabis farmers who've come over actually to come really? and work work in the in the fields and work on the trees and the harvest. And Udham does three things. He gets himself a new name, he gets himself a new job, and he gets himself a girlfriend. Well, he, he gets himself a girlfriend. He actually takes on a number of names. And it, this is going to be a hallmark of his life from this point onwards, is that he lives in various different places and everyone thinks he lives with them. So, you know, he's, he's a man for all seasons. He disappears into the white bits of town. So he's one of the few people who drinks in sort of, you know, white establishments, wears sort of suits. Uh, and he falls in love, you're quite right, with a Mexican woman called Lupe. Now, again... Yeah, this, is, this isn't going to be Frida Pinto playing this. Who's going to have... Go, I, mean, I, don't, I, I have no idea. I mean, I'll let you cast it. But, but <laughs> you see, the thing again is with Lupe, you know, there is, there is a woman who loves him. And who, you know, he marries. And if you believe some of the later... He's obviously a charismatic brutal, and resourceful guy. He's actually very yeah. handsome. I mean, there are pictures of him in his youth, which are in the, the right, book. The right picture. He's a, he, the right <laughs> picture of the right man. I mean, I mean, just look. I mean, that's a picture on the front of, of one of the early editions of the book. Uh, Anita's showing me uh, the cover of her book. And we have a man who looks rather like a, a rather more handsome version of Charlie Chaplin. Charlie Chaplin front. and yeah. Omar Sharif had a baby. <laughs> Somewhere between the two. This is their baby. Um, <laughs> so, you know, ha- handsome and dashing. Um, but... There was a thing in in um, America where 
Indians were not allowed to own land, but Mexicans were. So a lot of Punjabi men at the time married Mexican women so that they could own land. And he, his new name is nothing to do with India at all. Ud- Udam Singh has become? Well, he becomes Frank Brazil, a Puerto Rican. And he becomes Frank Brazil. I know you could say he becomes Frank Brazil so that his life will be easier. Sounds like a stage name. Yeah, but but actually, you know, in all probability, it's because now he has made contact in California with the Guthers. And I've managed to chart, you know, a, a number of alliances that he makes and residences that he lives in where there are known Guthers living. And, and what are the Guthers up to in America? They are raising money for arms. They are sending emissaries to Europe and to Russia in particular to try and get their men trained up and armed this so that they can so be then so this released. Is, I mean, Brits who are listening to this will be familiar with the Fenians doing this at the same time. So you've got the Irish Americans raising money uh, in Boston, particularly sending it back to Ireland and, uh, and, 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 and funding what will become the IRA. But this is going on among Sikhs. And Udham and Lupe do this moving around thing. Which, he he you works know, in, the, in the motor industry at one in point. A, no, you know, so this is crazy. He keeps trying We're to get jobs. Into Henry, Henry Ford cars yeah. now. So, you know, it's the whole history and, of America yeah. is sort of bound to him. And, you know, I talk about how, you know, there are some really very racist car companies and there are some that accept non-white workers. And he ends up sort of getting a really good job getting a good pay packet, and then something just yanks him out. And he starts appearing on manifests, going to Europe. So he's obviously working for the Guthers, doing this bag job, getting taking money gun over running. to... Well, gun running. Of course, it's gun running. Because he's taking money over to Eastern Europe, to Riga, to Latvia, which is a very common jumping off point to get into Russia for those people who don't have the right paperwork. And then he's coming back. So and this is now 1920s, the Russian Revolution yeah, has happened. Yeah, 19, sort of 1925 to 27 is this. And this the is Russians are now beginning to um, try and help similar Any, revolutions My enemy's in enemy the world. is my friend is the doctrine of resistance for a lot of groups and particularly the Guthers. They look to anybody who hates the British Empire as much as and, they I do. I mean, this is fantastically filmic and romantic. I mean, what was it actually amounted to? Were the real arms you know, being bought in quantities that's going to make any difference? Well, um, were they making it back to India, these, these gun runners? I mean, certainly um, Michael O'Dwyer and those who take over from him afterwards are worried about the Guther influence. Michael O'Dwyer, even though the Guthers are in their nascent form this in 1919 the during the massacre, is sufficiently worried about and anxious about them to make them a number one priority in his inbox. And and after that, the again, one of the are... things we, we from our kind of movies again. I'm I'm doing this all through sort of cinema, but you know, in the movie Gandhi, Indians have lattes, uh, but they don't have you don't have people sniping. And the, a and there are you know, or... and and I, I mean, the story that gets them first of all arrested in 1927 is is only a, f- a small amount of small arms. So he's you know again Frank Brazil. So Frank Brazil is an alias that the others are using to ship stuff to and from different parts of the world on different um, ships. So they're, they're Frank Brazils, who are Puerto Rican, oh, different sizes and heights and weights on every manifest that I've looked at. But Udham certainly does this trip uh, three or four times. But he's caught when he gets back to India. So he's carrying small arms with him. And he's in a boarding house? He is an idiot. So he's in a boarding house in Amritsar now with his expensive clothes and his money in his pocket. And he's in his home city. So what he does is what small time small town boys often do which is trying to show off to their friends and neighbors so he wears a western suit he's staying in the prostitutes quarters of Amritsar, the red light district the police officer in charge of that area gets a notification that there is a brown sahib who's wandering around and he sends somebody out it's all just on spec and they raid his rooms and they find the guns and money how and russian gu- passports how many handful guns? handful a handful of guns, not many guns, but he but gets them, them sent the away. He's got them into the country, and then he gets sent to prison. And then, you know, his prison years in the in the thirties, he's sent to a really very um, first first of all a, a, a prison in Delhi, and a notorious one. A lot of people are sent to the Andaman Islands, who are involved in this, in circular prisons where they're sort of kept apart from everyone else. But he's sent to a prison where he comes across. Again, uh, now you take this with a pinch of salt. This is what I've been told. But his family says he came across Bhagat Singh, who is a, you know, a lead ideological. So, so again, a, a name totally unknown in Britain, Michael but Collins, a major national Michael hero Collins in India. Michael Collins to yeah. you know the Indian freedom movement, if you like. And it's after that that he becomes and then again, set. Again, we should say that this is a, uh, 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 it's coming straight up in front of me now. Yeah. The, the Bhagat Singh's face, upturned, yes. upturned moustache, really handsome, handsome. 
little erudite, trill, trilby hat. Well or, educated, yeah. but you know, it, it's it's violent protests that he is involved in. He's the nephew of a man called Lajpat Rai, who is an actual nemesis of Gandhi's because they believe so different in such different approaches to getting rid of the British. From all these India. places, all these names are now Rhodes and Delhi. Yeah. Now they're Rajput Rai. And, right. Yeah. So anyway, so then this again, this is such a long and winding road. But after he's released from prison, he goes back to his hometown for a little while and he starts telling people I'm going after the big quarry, I'm going to England. And so in the 1930s... What exactly does he tell them? And, and how substantiated is this? Because you've been, you've been looking very hard at intelligence files and so on. So I can yeah. tell you that the people who knew his family in Sunam say that he once he's standing in front of a picture of Dilip Singh and he's crying and saying, this must be avenged. This must be avenged. Dilip I'm Singh, going back to avenge who we this. mentioned in an earlier podcast, is the Maharaja of the Punjab, uh, who is, as a child taken from the throne by the British. He loses the throne of the Punjab and ends up, uh, first of all, as Queen Victoria's friend, then he's, then he's let down and he ends up dying in a hotel room. Yeah, miserably broken alone in a Parisian hotel room. But a great symbol for Punjabis of lost, of lost statehood. Yeah, and so, so and certainly, you know, the, those people who knew him at the time, and I, you know, I found written records, contemporaneous records of people who said, you know, actually he just disappeared. He said he was going back to do something. He said, the next time you hear from me, you'll hear about me. Um, and he sort of washes up in, in Great Britain, where, you know, he plays so, low so for he's a, been a, a to number Mexico, of years. He's been to Bolshevik, he's been to Nazi Germany. Well, he, that's what he does when he's in Britain. So he, when he's in Britain in the 1930s, so this is very much Nazi Germany, he starts again changing his name, applying for different passports. He gets clocked and he's on the radar of the British authorities. You know, the Indian Police Intelligence Service already have an inkling that he's somebody to keep an eye on. Because he's been running, he's been he's caught with guns. He's going in and, and out and of Russian Riga. <laughs> he's been in prison. But they lose sight of him. They, You know, he keeps disappearing from sight. And he keeps surfacing. It's because he keeps multiple addresses here in, in Britain. And what's he called by the time he arrives in, in, in London? He keeps his. Sometimes he uses Cher Singh. Sometimes he uses Udham Singh. So, so what's he doing in um, uh, in Nazi Germany? I mean, and 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 I'm mean, so again such a sort of filmic moment. You know, we we because we don't know, and because British intelligence doesn't extend into. We know when he goes in. We know he comes out. We know they're watching him, and they put a tail on him when he comes back out. But we don't know anything other than he returns with money. So is he getting money from Nazi Germany? Is he getting it from the Bolsheviks? He has interfaces with both of those. My enemy's enemy is my friend. But he's able to maintain numerous homes around the country. So now in sort of Babylon, Berlin territory. Yeah. Is, is he talking to the, the German communists? Is he talking to well, the... Well, there's certainly an Indian presence in Germany at that time who really do think that they can elicit the help of Hitler and the Nazis to try and excise the British out of India. You know, and, you know, one of the most famous proponents of that is Subhash Chandra Bose, who we talk about elsewhere in this podcast series. Who goes to, uh, during the war, to seek help from, from Nazi Germany and then is smuggled in a submarine through to Japan. Indeed. So, you know, so, so Udham, we don't know what he does, but we know when he comes back, eyes are on him. And they're, they're letting him stay at large and at liberty. And, there and following are, him? And following him, for, for a while following him, but then they lose him. I mean, the, one of the people who sort of loses him, and this is when war breaks out, by the way. So he's, he's in and around London in about sort of, I think, of the seven or eight addresses that all think he's living with them. And, that you know, because it's quite fairly recent, you know. There, and there the Shepherd's are, Bush Gudwara keeps reappearing. Well, as it's funny. Kind of... So he uses it as his own bank. So there is somebody who says that... Um, uh, a wonderful recorded uh, archival memory from someone who says he used to go to the Gurdwara and people used to put money down on the tray, but he used to take money out. And somebody in the Gurdwara said, that's scandalous. What are you doing? He goes, what are you talking about? This is the Bank of Baba. This is between me and him. Because he was an atheist. He didn't believe in, in God. So, you know, but he was getting money from somewhere because he still was wearing the sharp suits. He always had cash. He had a car. He's one of the few people. He gets plugged into the peddler community in the UK because peddlers can move around the country completely invisibly nobody cares who they are but he, he becomes a peddler supposedly and he's sleeping in numerous house, peddler houses and was it your your gr grandfather who was a peddler it too? was my 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 husband's grandfather, grandfather. who started off in Taunton, somerset, somerset yeah. but you know was part of that peddler network they all used to buy from the same place in east london and they many of them have memories of them staying with them and on their floors and what's and what are we talking so a guy with a bicycle a guy with a push so he push had a car he had a car, which is unheard of. 
So, you know, most peddlers, either they were on foot or they had bicycles, but this guy had a car. So where does the money come from? That, you know, you follow the money. And there is definitely, he's doing things for other people. Is it the Gathers? Is it the Bolsheviks? Is it the Germans? Or is it all of them? Because this guy is a wheeler dealer. He's so charming. Everybody loves him. There's, you know, sort of audio recordings of people who say, like one guy who says, you know, he went for a drive to Leicestershire. He couldn't understand why Odin was taking him to Leicestershire. He was actually going to infiltrate an Indian Workers Association meeting where he wanted to stand at the back and see who really hated the British and sign them up but you know on the way they pass they see a policeman on a bicycle and he shows this passenger his gun and says shall I do it shall I do it and the guy's like no what are you talking about no not while I'm here and he goes no don't worry we don't kill mice we cats kill bigger quarry so is he actually fixated about O'Dwyer the governor of the Punjab over whom the Jamala mass, uh, massacre he, took place. He certainly is incensed by what happens after the massacre. So, you know, while he's in prison in 1927, uh, Rex Dyer dies and is given almost a state funeral. So, again, for those who, who, who uh, are understandably muddled by two very similar very names, similar names which have, are merged yeah. in the Indian <laughs> psyche, by the way, they, they meld him into one person. So, there is regularly. General Dyer, who is the man that actually. Gives the fire. order fire. Mm -hmm. uh, but above him in the political network, and still alive, crucially, at yeah. this point in the story, in the late 1930s now, uh, is uh, Michael O'Dwyer, who's a completely different man. He's Irish. He was the governor of the Punjab, but he's now back, retired in England, giving speeches about empire. Giving speeches about how everything was done correctly and how if a little more of that medicine would not be amiss for the Indians. And we wouldn't have the trouble we now have in India, he if says. we yeah. were a bit stronger and what Dyer did was right. You know, whereas Dyer, Dyer is a broken man by all accounts. You know, he's haunted by guilt or question, at least questions what happened that day in the garden. It's a very, very moving part of your book where yeah. we have the, uh, Dyer in old age wondering whether he's damned. He says, you when know, he says, I'm going to die and I'm going to find out very shortly whether I was right or, or I was wrong. I'm going to meet my maker and I will find out. But, you know, Sir Michael, on the other hand, doesn't lose. He says in his own memoirs, I didn't lose a day's sleep. I, I didn't lose a night's sleep over this. So this has definitely gripped his imagination. But does he then, it's 20 years. So let's, let's cut forward. So war has broken out now. Germany is is marching through Europe. Belgium has fallen. There's been Dunkirk. And in the middle of all this, bizarrely, O'Dwyer is still giving lectures about Amritsar and about the Punjab. But he is, and but he's also, you know, now there's more attention on India because India is now again a, a huge in, a strategic importance, and it is at one of these lectures where actually Michael O'Dwyer is not the lead speaker; he's giving the vote of thanks at the end that Udham Singh sees his chance, and the date is the thirteenth of March, nineteen forty. He prepares himself he's got his papers in uh, he gets rid of them he's registered himself under a really important name he calls himself Muhammad Singh Azad now if you're an Indian you know the importance of that name because one of those names Muhammad is a Muslim name Singh is a Sikh name Azad means freedom so he knows what he's going to do that day he goes he's armed with a gun that he has procured with bullets that don't fit it although he won't know that properly until it's too late. He waits, he goes into this hall at Caxton Hall, which is actually, you know, what's really amazing about this? It is Caxton Hall is as far away from Westminster as Jallianwala Bagh is from uh, the Golden Temple. Very close. Very, very close. And he waits, he sort of comes in right at the last minute, doesn't have in a ticket, suit. in his suit with a hat over his eyes, stands at the side, waits for all the speeches to end, and then very calmly, walks up to the front after Sir Michael is sort of shaking hands with all the great and the good who've delivered the speeches, extends his hand. And Sir Michael, you know, the autopsy report is very revealing. He thinks he's shaking his hand, so he puts his hand forward and he shoots him twice through the heart at point-blank range. And the first time, the first bullet doesn't... Or no, it's the wrong calibre? No, the, the bullets go straight through Sir Michael, but then he tries to kill the Secretary of State. 
Every bullet finds a billet. That's what they say <laughs> in the trial. So he wheels around, he tries to shoot the Secretary of State for India, who is also there, Lord Lamington, uh, a former uh, Lieutenant Governor of India, Louis Dane is there, he, he shoots, but these bullets, are, they don't fit the gun properly. So some of them don't have that um, projectile force that they ought to have. So he only kills one man, and he kills the man that he presses himself almost up against, and that is Sir Michael O'Dwyer who ironically dies in a pool of his own blood like so many people did in Jallianwalabagh. And he says when he's arrested, my name is Mohammed Singh Azhar. They finally, you know, they all get into, you know, all of their motions of trying to find out who is this man? Where did he come from? How, how have we not seen him? They find out he was on an MI5 watch list. And I do mean MI5. MI5 has just been created by a man called Vernon Kell, who personally has rung up a police station saying, can you tell me more about this man? who's working here, it's with them saying, working at the Blanford uh, militia camp. He's sort of, you know, trying to get himself into any, any place where he can collect information to send to whoever his masters may be at the time. But he's just there at the right place at the right time to exact his revenge. And he, you know, it's, it's a very long story. <laughs> but we haven't quite finished it. So, so he's then, he's, he's, he gives himself up? He doesn't, he tries he to escape, first of all, and he <laughs> tries to run. Um, and he's body checked into a wall by a very large woman called Bertha Herring. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody's a little bit stunned except Bertha, big Bertha, drops her umbrella and just physically body checks him into a wall, by Brilliant. which time everybody wakes up and they all start jumping on him. And then he lies completely still and he says, right, take me, I'm ready. And the police come, he doesn't offer any resistance at all. And he wants his trial to be the trial of the decade. He wants to make all these incendiary speeches. But again, you know, you look through all the secret documents, the British won't let him. They issue an order and they, and this is kind of a bit shameful as a, as a journalist. They are all complicit and they say, we won't report a word of it. You know, there's missives to Reuters, Reuters saying, we won't, don't worry. So no one knows about this. No they? one knows about it. And so he's there in prison they must know that O'Dwyer has been shot. They know. That, that is huge. Goebbels uses it. I mean, it breaks on the six o'clock news and Goebbels then uses it as um, part of his propaganda that at last, you know, this monstrous British who perpetrated the massacre at Jallianwala Bagh, the man responsible has been gunned down quite rightly in London. So it's a major piece of propaganda. So that's why they are beside themselves to shut Udham up, shut up his name. They take away his name, Mohammed Singh Azad, which he wants to be prosecuted under. They say, that's not your name. You're with them saying, we know we've got you on a watch list. Um, and, and tell me about his last days in prison. He's, well, he's, he's non-cooperative. He wants to die by his own hand. He doesn't want to be hanged. So first of all, he's under the impression that he might be able to string things out by being very confusing and giving all sorts of conflicting evidence. But he does say to one of the guards and one of the <laughs> little bits of information in his file that it was about, it was high time Sir Michael went. Michael's had his day now, you know. So, you know, those people who say, did he deliberately single out Michael O'Dwyer? Because he says all sorts of peculiar things through his trial. Yes, he did. He absolutely did. Um, but he goes on hunger strike. He tries to kill himself. He tries to get Where's stuff. Where's he kept? He's at Pentonville Prison uh, in the end, and Brixton for a bit. On death row. He's on death row, yeah. So he knows, he knows. He, and he uh, eventually, you know, he sort of, he goes on hunger strike. It's only when it is becomes apparent the British are going to speed through his execution. He's not going to have that. He's trying to bide his time and spin things out until the Germans win the war. Because he thinks he's got a chance if the Germans win the war. But they're going to speed through the trial, and they do. And he's sentenced to death. So then he starts eating again. By the way, he does sort of have a suicide bid where people are trying on the outside, the gather friends, to give him poison and give him things to kill himself. But they all get intercepted <laughs> in the post room. So in the end, he's hung. He's hanged by the notorious, the assistant on that hanging trial was Albert Pierpoint, who is the most famous hangman in Britain. And Albert, thanks to Albert Pierpoint, we know that it was a botched execution because he wasn't the lead executioner at the time. The man who was the lead executioner, because with him has been on hunger strike, his weight's been fluctuating wildly, um, misjudges his weight. And so all we know, again, from records that only unsealed in 2016, that man never worked at Pentonville again. 
What happens to his memory? What, what point does he, if, if the news hasn't got out, what point does he become a great hero of the nationalist movement? Well, he sort of, you know, it's the, the, the word starts leaking out that uh, everyone knows that Sir Michael has died and immediately actually Gandhi and Nehru repudiate his actions. They don't want to be seen as men of violence. They're still hanging out for, you know, a negotiated settlement. They don't want to unleash that genie. In Punjab, the Congress Party, the Youth Congress Movement, turn their backs on Gandhi and Nehru and say, actually, this man is a hero. So under the surface, he's sort of bubbling away in the consciousness of Punjab that this man is a hero. He's hanged. News of it kind of gets a little bit buried. But it's only in the 1970s when Indira Gandhi is prime minister of India that this, this clamor goes up saying, we want our boy back. Bring him home. Just bring him home. And they dig up his remains in Pentonville. He's next to, he's in between Roger Casement and Crippen, his remains are. I've seen where he was buried. Um, They dig him up. There's a huge diplomatic hoo-ha about it, but they take him back and he goes home to a hero's welcome. He does like a two-week tour of India, his remains do. Posthumous. Posthumous tour. And he finally ends up in Sunam. And, you know, this. I'll just end with this. Somebody uh, who who's the son of the mayor of Sunam at the time, or the headman of Sunam, said it was Sunam was like a bride that day, and the groom came home. That was an extraordinary telling of an extraordinary story, Anita. I I, I loved your book, but hearing you um, just tell the tale yourself is is is, is wonderful, just wonderful. Thank you. Uh, for anyone that hasn't read it, the Patient Assassin uh, is available and and <clears throat> is an extraordinary. Extraordinary account of uh, a, a wonderful piece of detective work, which won Anita the, what's it called, the Hessel Tiltman Prize? Ben Hessel Tiltman. <laughs> yeah, the, the, the Charlene Tilton. Award. No, it's not the Charlene Tilton. That was from Dallas. No, Ben Hessel Tiltman Award is what it was. <laughs> Hessel Tiltman Award. Anyway, Udam Singh is a name which all our Indian listeners will know immediately. Uh, he's a household name across India and, and part of the pantheon of, of, of new political gods. Uh, but I think he's almost completely unknown in England. So hopefully this podcast will will start uh, the beginnings of, of changing that. That's all from us. Thank you very much for listening. Um, I've been Anita Arnand. And I am William Drupal.